Before we come to the reading and the reflection on the reading, I want to do a little bit of introduction to the book of Ruth that we're going to be looking at over the course of this week and the next three weeks. I've entitled it Wings of Refuge after a passage in Ruth chapter two where Boaz says to Ruth, uh, a blessing on you really, welcoming her into, if you like, the family of the God under whose wings she has come to take refuge. So wings of refuge. It's important for us to understand when Ruth, the story of Ruth is set. We must remember as well, of course, that the, the story was written down a long time after the time in which the story was set. And the story was set in the time of the judges. The first line really of the book is in the days when the judges judged. And in those days, there was social and religious chaos. There was violence. If you read the book of Judges, it's one of the most violent books of the whole Bible. And every time there is a refrain in this downward spiral of experience that the people of God had, it says there was no king in Israel and every person did that which was right in their own eyes. So this is the time when the story of Ruth takes place. And it seems to me that one of the things about Ruth is that it presents a contrast to those days because in the book of Ruth, we find kindness. We find social cohesion. You know, the, the, the group of people in Bethlehem were supportive to them. And there was good leadership. When we go to the end of the, towards the end of the book, we find that Boaz is a good person who is a leader within the community. And in fact, those who are involved in the story are the ancestors of David, who was the epitome of good kingship. So Ruth presents a contrast. But you wonder, why was this little story written? Um, it seems like uh, an idyllic story in a way, uh, almost sort of boy meets girl and sort of lives happily ever after, after a few nasty bits at the beginning. Um, but it, it must have been written for more than that reason to tell a nice story. And one of the reasons it was written is right at the very end, to introduce David into the story, because that leads us into the book of First Samuel, First and Second Samuel, where David becomes king. But it also tells us how to act in contrast to the day of the judges. I mentioned that kindness was one of the things that is evident in the story. And that word kindness is um, re a reflection of a Hebrew word that is chesed. And we'll talk, don't worry about that just now, we'll be talking about that as, as the time goes on. But it's a very, very important word that can mean several different things. And one English word can't encompass it. But if we think about it for the moment as kindness, that will do. But also this book, as we read the terrible beginning of it and the lovely ending of it, it speaks to us something of the providence of God, that God is in, if you like, the whole story and not just Ruth's story and Boaz, but our story as well. As modern readers, we are not very good with repetition. We like, if, we've, we've, if we see words repeated in our own writing, we tend to get Roger's Thesaurus out and find a different word. But in an old story, and looking at an old story in an old way, repetition is really important because it is a sign to us that this is a big part of the story. So when we read the book of Ruth and we see repetition of various things, it is a, it is a sign to us, this 
is important. And we are to read with an eye to other stories. I've already mentioned the fact that we read with an eye to the book of Judges and maybe to the book of First and Second Samuel, but we also read with an eye to stories that go back to other, um, other famines in the Bible and what the characters did there. And, and some of what the characters did is reflected in what Naomi and Ruth did. And we've got to look at the structure of the book. Now, the structure, fortunately for us, is a small book, and those who put it into chapters did a good job on this occasion because it's got a prologue, that is the first five or so verses of chapter one, and then the rest of chapter one is act one, and then in chapter two, we've got act two. In chapter three, we've got act three. In chapter four, we've got act four plus an epilogue. So the structure of the book is really pretty simple and straightforward. Um, but it's good to get that into our heads to see how the story moves along. Evangeline is going to come up in a minute or so um, to, to read the story for us, and there are, I'm terribly sorry, there are a number of, of names, some of which are more difficult than others, but we'll call him Elimelech just now. And that name is important because it means my God is king. And we'll see how this plays out in an adverse way in Elimelech's life. Naomi means my pleasant one, which will be important for the end of our story uh, today, Act 1. The, the names Malon and Kilion are to do with being sickly and coming to an end. And so we are not surprised in the story when, when they die. And Bethlehem. The bet bit means house, and the lechem bit means bread, so house of bread. And there is a great irony here that the house of bread has no bread because there is a famine in land. So as we carry these names with us through this first act, let us remember what they mean and let us remember the significance of them um, we are going to be thinking today of Act 1, and Act 1 I've called The Road to Sorrow, and we'll see why that is the case in a moment or two. And I'm going to ask Evangeline to come up now and uh, read Ruth chapter 1 for us. Actually, I'm not sure which page in the um, Pew Bible, uh, we, maybe, we maybe don't have Pew Bibles in place. Um, so. Let's, oh, are you controlling this, David? Yeah. Right, okay, that's fine. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The, na the man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi and the names of the two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Beth Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye and wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, 
my daughters, I am too old to have another husband, even if, even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and gave birth to sons. Would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it's more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand is turned against me. At this they wept aloud again, then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman exclaimed, exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Thank you very much indeed, Evangeline. Amen, and thanks be to God for his word. As we come to the reflection then, let's pray together. Open our eyes, O Lord, that we may see the wonderful truths contained in your word. Amen. We're going to walk with Naomi today to Moab and then back to Bethlehem. And as we do so, what we're going to do is reflect on a time of loss not only Naomi's losses, one, one of the things I'm very conscious about in the last year or so, let's say, is that in Liberton Kirk, we have lost quite a number of people and we are feeling that loss. Um, indeed, I remember Grant Cook, who's probably watching on Zoom, saying that never in his experience has he known so many people to have been lost or in such a short time within the membership of the Kirk. So we're going to reflect on, on that together as well. But the first name that appears is Elimelech. And Elimelech is the head of a family. Many years ago, indeed in the 19th century, Tolstoy wrote, all happy families resemble one another but each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And this family is an unhappy family. And the reason it is unhappy is because it is in danger of famine. We mentioned that Elimelech means my God is king. And it probably is a reflection that Elimelech was an important person in the Bethlehem community. But here, he does not live up to his name and say, yes, my Lord is king, and therefore I will remain here because God will sort this out. He takes his family from the empty house of bread to the fields of Moab. And this is a decision that Elimelech, as the head of the family, made, a decision that would lead from one catastrophe to another. This is the first of Naomi's losses. You can see from the map that it is not a long journey, possibly two days walk for them, depending on how much stuff they were taking. But Naomi loses connection with her Bethlehem family loses connection with her family and friends, and they go on this journey, which is, although not long, it is very significant, and it is into alien territory because 
The Moabites and the Israelites were not usually on friendly terms. And they lived there as aliens with the intention of returning at some point. When they got to Moab, the fields of Moab, it says, they found food, they found life, but they also found death. Naomi, first of all, lost her husband, Elimelech. I've, over the course of the next few minutes, I'm going to speak as someone who's been a pastor for some decades and, and my reflections on people's experience. And it has been my experience that the death of a spouse, whether that's husband or wife, even if the circumstances mean that it is sometimes seen as a blessing and in relief from suffering, it is a totally life changing experience. Life utterly alters with the death of a spouse. It alters in all sorts of ways. It even in, you know, in, if you're in your house, and you turn to speak to someone, they're not there. And we miss them. We miss them day by day at our side in the things that we do. And this was the first of many losses, really significant losses that, that Naomi had. And then her sons, after her husband's death, her sons married women who were not of Naomi's faith. In the text, it says they took wives for themselves, one called Orpah, one called Ruth. And it looks as if they did not ask for Naomi's permission to do this. They had been expecting to come home to Bethlehem much earlier than this. But now the boys were up and were looking to create families of their own. And all of us who have children, we realize that we can never make the decisions for our children. They need to make decisions for themselves. And sometimes our children make decisions that we would not like them to make that we see as a, a, a wrong road, if you like, and we can't do anything about it. And it seems to me that this is one of these points in Naomi's life where her sons made decisions that she would not have made for them. Sometimes these decisions um, fracture family relationships. Fortunately, in this case, it did not, and the daughters-in-law showed great kindness both to the husbands and to Naomi as mother-in-law. The next loss is that not only her, son, uh, her husband died, but her, both of her sons died. And I have observed that one of the things that marks a parent's life forever afterwards is the death of a child and obviously the death of two children is even more excruciating for them. There is a word that is used in the text that, not, that is not reflected in the English translation, but it is the death of her babies really that, that she mourns. And it is a, a word that is such a tender word she mourned her two sons, the ones to whom she gave birth. In all of this, Naomi lost her security. Her security had been bound up with her husband, and if he died, that her sons would look after her. 
but they have now gone, and her future is totally uncertain. And she has lost her identity. There is no one there to call her wife. There is no one there to call her mother. And her future has completely changed, her envisaged future. No longer can she expect to nurse grandchildren and great-grandchildren. She has completely lost her place in life and her future is just so fragile. It seems to me that Ruth chapter 1 speaks to us, not just of Naomi, but all of us who are hurting because of the losses of many different kinds. And we reflect on these losses today. But how does Naomi respond to this loss? It is, in, in fact, not a terribly surprising response. But she discovers that the Lord, and it's important to notice this, the Lord had provided food to Bethlehem in the house of bread. So the house of bread is now once again full of bread. And she decides to go home. And the three of them set out together on the road to Judah. But Naomi thinks, these girls are going to have no life with me. These girls need to go back home and recreate their own family because they have had significant losses as well. And Orpah, the name Orpah has something to do with neck and it looks as if Orpah turns around and shows the back of her neck to Naomi and goes back to Moab. But Naomi and Ruth move forward and they go to Bethlehem. And the women of Bethlehem say, can this be Naomi? They look at her and they recognize her, but they, they see that the years and the experiences have taken their toll on her and she is almost unrecognizable. And she says to them, don't call me Naomi. Remember, Naomi means my pleasant one. Call me Mara. And Mara means bitter. The experiences of life for Naomi have been bitter. But not only that, within her own heart, there is this bitterness against God. She says, I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. And, and we must be careful to observe that she says, the Lord brought me back empty. It wasn't just that she returned herself, but the Lord brought her back. But she has been brought back empty and she is bitter against God for this. And she laments to God and to the women of Bethlehem. Now, I don't know how you respond to losses in your own life. But if you read the Psalms, you will find that so many of the Psalmists, when they experience great losses in their lives, they rage at God. But God is big enough to take it. And one of the important things in the life of Naomi is to see that the Lord encompasses this whole experience. Everything that takes place in her life takes, pla takes place within the sphere of which the Lord has control. And so she laments at God. I came across this quotation in a, in a book that I was reading during the course of the week. Laments are not failures of faith. They embody faith. And how do they embody faith? They say that these, these losses, 
they all take place within this fear which God is in control. And if our rage, our anger goes out, it goes towards the Lord, which is a statement of faith that we believe the Lord hears us and will respond to us. So laments are not failures of faith. They embody faith. So Ruth chapter 1 speaks to us of those who are hurting because of losses of many kinds. And if you find yourself in the same kind of situation as Naomi and lament at God, remember that that is a good thing to do. God is big enough to hear our anger and to enfold us in his love. But it also speaks to those of us who share this life with with them, those who have lost someone. And, you know, at different points in life, we have different losses and, and others can come in and, and be with us in that loss. And so the question for us today as well is, how do we respond to the losses of others? And this is one of the places where this word chesed comes into play, because it is kindness and it is commitment. We were speaking about commitment earlier on. Um, this is the kind of kindly commitment that is utterly essential for others to be able to get through their losses. We're not going to speak today about Ruth's great Speech to Naomi, we'll do that next week. But here's the thing, as Ruth came back with Naomi, there is a note of hope. Naomi did not come back as empty as she thought. She thought that Ruth would be a burden to her as she came back. But in fact, Ruth is going to be a helper for her. Ruth is a symbol of hope who acts with this kindness and commitment to Naomi. And we must remember that in the losses that we suffer, these losses will not be the last word. There is hope. And as Christians, we know that our hope is in Christ who has given himself for us and, and who offers new life and eternal life to us. In this instance, it will be a hope that we will see unfolding as the acts of the story go on. But we're going to just have a moment of quietness now and reflect on our own losses and how we address God about them and how we have experienced any help in relation to them, or how we might be able to help others. And then we are going to sing a song of hope. 